All right, I trust by now you found your place there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> and so we'll pick it up at verse number 24. The title of the message is simply, Run. Any runners? Do we have any runners? Was anybody out running this morning before church? Nobody here was out running this morning before church. Okay, well, we'll get to that. Does anyone ever run? Okay. Well, thank God, Brother Rick, you saved the day. You're walking. All right. That counts for something. Then I hope you walk fast. Amen. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, <clears throat> know you not that they which run in a race run all, you, you know. But one receiveth the prize. Now, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna receive the prize, you gotta run, you gotta finish the race. You, you quit the race, you, you know. The prize is not awarded to the quitter, it's awarded to the finisher, you know. That's, that's what God's word is telling us here. Um, <clears throat> so run that you may obtain. I'll never forget a photograph I saw in uh, a magazine, oh, years and years ago. And they were doing, in the magazine, they were doing a... Um, they were featuring the Summer Olympics. And they had photographed several of these athletes. And, uh, you know, in top physical condition. Yeah. Uh, and one of the photographs caught my eye because it was a, a very, very powerful muscular runner. A man. Who had all of his life prepared to run this particular Olympic race. And the reason the photograph caught my eye is because he was lying on his back. He was lying on his back at the starting block of the race. And he, and he was and he was lying there and and then there was a man hovering over him and it was the uh, it was the uh, what uh, what do they call the uh, track event would it be a ref would it be a referee for track official the official was standing over him and neither one of them had happy countenances and so you know the photograph pulled me into the article, so I started to read the article. And this is what I learned. This man, who had spent all of his life preparing to run this particular race for a prize, and you know what the prize is, right? Of the, uh, you know what the prize is of the Summer Olympics, right? The, the, the most preferred prize above all other prizes would be the what? The gold medal. And the article went on to say that the official was ordering him to leave the track. But he was refusing to leave the track. He would not get up off of his back he just kept lying there on the track, staring up into the sky with this official hovering over him. Now, how do you come upon a scene like that at the Summer Olympics? Well, what happened is he broke the rules. And because he broke 
the rules, the officials and the Olympic Committee declared him disqualified. You broke the rules. You've lost your position. You're ordered to leave the track. Now think about this. Let it sink in for a moment. Do you realize everything this man vested into this race? His, his entire life from childhood, he was groomed, he was raised, he was trained. I mean, he was a big, powerful, muscular man. I mean, and there he laid, flat on his back, disqualified. You know, when, when people win the gold medal, it, it's more than standing on the podium, listening to the national anthem. When, when, a, when an athlete wins the gold medal, do, do you understand that charts the course of the rest of their life? Do you realize that? You win the gold. When you win the gold, you're winning the hearts of the world. When you win the gold, you're winning the hearts of corporate America. Do you know what that means to win the hearts of corporate America? It means you're going to be their poster person on all of their product. You're going to be the face, the image, on all of their products. And you're going to help them sell all of their goods, all of their services. Because you're a winner. I mean, that's how it works. I'm, you know, I'm telling you, when this, when this man, when this man broke, the rules lying there flat on his back that day the summer olympics they couldn't get him off the track they had to bring others in and they had to very strongly compel him sir you must leave the track wow boy look at what the Word of God is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? But one receiveth the prize. Now, 2,000 years ago, they ran for an olive branch that would be uh, put together and placed on the head of the uh, victorious athlete uh, and so uh, the admonition is so run that ye may obtain wow how incredible is that I just I can hardly get over it to this day even though it's been all those years ago how much that man lost how much he lost because he broke the rules and that's really what Paul the Apostle is saying. He's being inspired by God. He's saying, no, don't break the rules. Um, you know, the, uh, um, we, look, we're, child of God, believer, Christian, we're not, we're not running for an olive branch. We're not, we're not even running for a gold medal. But did you know? Uh, well, in fact, uh, I think the Bible gives us exactly what we're running for. Look at it here. Um, verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery 
is temperate. Temperate uh, means disciplined. You know, if you're a if you're going to be a victorious athlete, you cannot let your physical body you cannot let your physical body go. You cannot allow your physical body all of its fleshly appetites. And that's really what the word temperate means, because because if you if you allow your physical body as a believer to be your master and you become the slave of your physical body, you're not going to win. Not only are you not going to win, ultimately you will be disqualified. And that is because within your physical body resides the sin nature. That's where sin is. It's in your physical body. It courses through your blood. And so sin compels people to do ungodly, evil, wicked deeds. All of which disqualify. And so this is written to the church. This is addressed to people that know Jesus. The, and you have, you know, Jesus came in, but you still have that sin nature residing in your physical body. And uh, you have this dual nature, you have this constant battle raging within. You have the Holy Spirit of God residing and prompting you to live life within God's will for your life. And then you have the sinful flesh within saying, uh, just live for self, you know. Just whatever feels good, do it. Never mind what God says. Just live for pleasure. And that would be sinful pleasure. Sinful pleasure. And Paul says, to, no, don't disqualify yourself. No. No. Now, these uh, athletes 2,000 years ago and these athletes today, uh, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Corruptible means that it's only temporary. You know, the olive branch, it wilts, it dies. It's just very temporary. But we, the child of God, we run to obtain an incorruptible crown. Now we know the price. Now we know what the price is. It's the crown. Now, let's, uh, let's have you mark your place here. Would you do that? Do you have a Bible ribbon or a mark or something? It'll help you. Um, so, well, you know, people, what do they do with these gold medals? It's silver, bronze. What do they do with these silver cups or these, you know, gold cups, whatever they, the prize may be? What do they do with it? Put it on the shelf, and it becomes something else to dust, right? But what about these crowns? What about these prizes for the child of God? Well, what's to be done with these crowns that are won if we follow God's plan, God's will? Now, we're not talking about salvation. No, no, let's not get confused here, please. Let's not get confused here. 
Salvation is not a reward. Salvation is a gift. You don't do anything for a gift. No, these crowns are rewards. Let's, let's not get confused now. So we're talking about, two, we're talking about, we talked about salvation at the 930 hour. Right now we're, we're talking about rewards. This is what you earn. These are not given, these are earned. And they're earned because you made the decision to love and obey Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, uh, but I'll let the Bible speak. God will speak for himself in his words. So uh, let me get myself back to uh, Revelation. Uh, are you there? Revelation chapter 4, please. Uh, I don't want to lose you, so uh, we'll all try to stay. Last book of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter four. So, what about these crowns? These crowns that may be earned by faithful, loving obedience to Jesus Christ. And by the way, it won't be easy. It's not the easy life. No, it'll require discipline. Every moment of every step of the way, discipline. This constant battle, your flesh saying, oh, just do what your body, just let your body have its way. Now, you know you want to. You know you have this sinful desire. Just do it. Where have I heard that expression, just do it? I know I didn't make that up. I've heard that. Just do it. Just do it. But then the Holy Spirit within says, don't do it. Love and obey Jesus Christ. Don't lose the crown. This battle rages within. But look at this. So what about, what are we doing with the crown? Uh, the Bible speaks of at least five of them. Did you know that? Five crowns of the believer. Wow. At least five of them. There it is, Revelation 4, verse 10. Uh, and uh, the, now this is a scene in the future. This, this is that time that we all get to appear before Jesus Christ. We all get to stand before Jesus Christ. That is if you've accepted him, if you've believed in him, if you know him. And now, if you decide, no, I, I'm not going to believe in Jesus. I'm not going to invite him to come into my life. No, I'm not going to do that. Well, you won't be at this scene. If, if, you, if you die without Christ, you'll be at another scene. It won't be this scene. This is exclusive to those who have believed in Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 10. And uh, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne... He's on the throne. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the great God of glory. He's on the throne. And worship him that liveth forever and ever. And, and what did they do with their crowns? They, they cast their crowns before the throne not on the throne, not at the throne, but before the throne. And so the word picture is the crowns are placed at the feet of the one sitting on the throne. Well, now I don't understand that. I mean, you, you don't see the athletes of the Olympics giving up their prizes. They keep their prizes. They don't cast their prizes at 
the feet of someone else, but the child of God does. And the reason they're casting their crowns at the feet of Jesus in this future scene is because the statement they're making is, Lord Jesus, were it not for your grace in my life, I would not have this crown. This crown is all and only because of you. You get all the glory, you get all the credit, you get all the praise, you get all the thanks. This crown belongs to you. What a scene. Well, that's what they're saying in verse 11. Look at it. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Now, these athletes in the world today, when they win the medal, when they win silver cup, whatever the prize may be, they get all the glory but not here. No, Jesus Christ gets all the glory, the honor, and the power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God, were it not for you creating me, this would have never happened. It's all because of you that I have received this. And they give God all of the glory. Now, uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you would, please. Uh, and so we'll get a little more uh, in-depth look at what's um, you know, happening here. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and uh, verse number 10. Now look at this. Wow. And, uh, and the scene we just looked at in Revelation is we're going to look at before it happens as recorded in Revelation. Uh, so 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10, for we must, what must we, now we, that is every believer, every saved person. What must we do? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone, every Christian uh, may receive the things done in his what? In his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad. As a Christian, we all get to we all get to answer to God about all the good things we did in our body and all of the evil, sinful, wicked things we did in our did in our body. We get to explain all of that to God as we appear before him and he's looking in our eyes. Now, <laughs> in this world of immediate gratification, not a lot of people stop and think about that. <laughs> but uh, here it is in the word of God. In verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Uh, look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, heading back to our text, but 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And so we'll drop down to verse 13 and uh, you know, we'll read on through verse number, uh, number 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse number 13, um, every man's work shall be made manifest. It'll all be revealed. It'll all be exposed. You know, uh, you know it, it's, here's the mistake. People, even God's people, think that if they do something sinful privately, that 
Nobody's going to know about it. Uh, but wait a minute. Every man's work shall be made manifest. God's going to take the cover off. God's going to take the lid off. He's going to manifest it. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a what? A reward. Uh, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. So these crowns may both be won, but they may also be lost. But here's, here's a, a, a wonderful statement. But he himself shall be what? Saved. Yet so is be fire. As by fire. So isn't that a, isn't that a wonderful truth? You can, you can lose, you can both earn the crowns. But then you can turn around and lose the crowns. But God says there's one thing you won't lose. Your salvation. You'll still be saved. So here's the picture then. Here's the picture. Back to the throne of Jesus Christ. The myriads of people standing before the throne of Jesus Christ. Some with crowns in hand, but others empty-handed. Oh, they're there. They're still there. They're empty-handed. What's it going to feel like to watch the saints of God cast their crowns at the feet of Jesus? What's it going to feel like to be standing there empty-handed with nothing to place at the feet of Jesus? Because, because you broke the rules. Oh, you're still saved. You're saved by grace through faith. You're not saved by works. The crowns are obtained by works. I'm asking you to pause and reflect for a quick moment. What's it going to feel like? Because in my life as a child of God, I broke the rules. I broke the rules not because I had to, not because I was forced to, but because I chose to. And on this day, before the throne of Jesus Christ, I'm standing there empty-handed while so many others all around me as they cast their crowns at the feet of Jesus are praising him, worshiping him, giving him honor, giving him glory. And I have nothing. It's how is your life race going? You're running your race every day. How long will I be running my race until you meet Jesus as a child of God, as a believer now? Um, and by the way, um, you say, wow, well, I'm a believer, but I've sure been breaking the rules. Well, hey, if you are a believer, did you know? Today is the first day of the rest of your life. 
Did you know if you are a believer, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Did you know that you could begin anew and afresh today by rededicating your life to Christ and finish your race well? There's still time. Wow. Let's go back to our text in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We've kind of been bouncing around here. Um, <clears throat> so chapter 9 and uh, let's... Uh, Let's, let's continue on in, uh, in verse 26. So Paul, the apostle, says, I therefore so run. Paul says, <laughs> Paul says, I'm running my race, and when I appear before Jesus Christ, I will have these crowns. He says, uh, I therefore so run. I'm running according to the word of God, the will of God, the plan of God for my life, I know the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. I know God is watching me. I know God is listening to me. And I'm going to run my race according to his rules. It says, I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly... So fight I, not as one that uh, beateth the air. I'm not just uh, uh, living my life without God's plan, without God's purpose. I'm just not living my life in vanity. God, you know what he's saying? I'm making every moment of my life count for the glory of God. I'm not just beating the air. I'm not just playing around. My life is counting for the glory of God. I'm not wasting any of my life. And then he goes on to say in verse 27, but I keep, look what he says. This is incredible. He says, I keep under my body. And bring it into what? Look at what he says. Now, it's a powerful statement. He says, I keep under my body. You go to the Greek language from which this is translated. And what the Apostle Paul has just told the church at Corinth, Paul has just matter-of-factly stated my physical body is not going to make a slave out of me. I'm making a slave out of my body. I'm not going to live my life in servitude to my body. He says, my body will be made to serve Jesus Christ. It's one of the most powerful statements that I've ever read from the Apostle Paul. How is it with you, child of God? Who's the master in your life? Is your body sinful, fallen? You say, preacher, how do you know my body is sinful and fallen? By virtue of the fact your body is dying. Now, you know, I'm reminded it really sobers me up when I'm with my, when I was with my children. You know, my, your body is aging. I, you know, look, I'm not, you know, how can you say such a thing, preacher? Well, and just let me tell on, let me tell on myself. So I've got my, <clears throat> I've got my children with me. And I'm, I'm in a public place. And I introduce my children to somebody. 
And here's the response I get. Um, well, how old are you? I just say their names, and I don't say they're my children. You know, I might say this is my daughter. And, and the response was, well, how, how old did you say your, your granddaughters were? Are you kidding me? No, no, those aren't my grandchildren. Those are my children. See, I'm trying to make a point, and the point is, how do I know that uh, my body is is corrupt. My body is dying because my body is aging. My body is not yet saved. My body has the sin nature, and it's in a constant battle with the Holy Spirit of God that resides within. Wow. How amazing is that? Paul says, we need to listen to the apostle. This is the inspired word of God. Paul says, when my body, whenever my body is tempting me to step out of God's plan and God's will and God's design for my life, Paul says, I tell my body in the name of Jesus Christ, no, you're not going to do that. No, we're not going to do that. No, you're not going to cause me to sin against my God. The word of God says, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, and we're not going to do it. My body is my slave. I'm not slave to my body. Now, wow. Go to 1 Timothy, if you would, please. Uh, who's your master? Who's running your life? Who's in control of you? Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, or your sinful, wicked, fleshly body? Whose slave are you? Are you your body's slave? Or are you the slave of Jesus Christ? Whose slave are you? 1 Timothy chapter 4 and, uh, and verse number 8. Now, now Look at this. Uh, talking about the body, uh, here, here's a verse that's often quoted but misinterpreted. Uh, for bodily exercise does what? Oh well, well, then I guess I won't. I won't exercise because it because it profiteth little. But there's little profit in bodily exercise, so I'm not going to exercise. Hold on, that's not what God said. Do you know what God is saying here? Bodily exercise profiteth, and the word little means for the duration of your life here upon the earth. Bodily exercise will profit you for as long as God wills for you to live on the earth. It will profit you. Not for eternity, but for all of the time you're on the earth. Now, that is a literal rendering of that verse. Paul says, you know, and, and here, I, I want you to understand, I hope God helps you to get it. The apostle Paul is talking about disqualifying factors in our lives as children of God. And Paul says... My body is not going to disqualify me from winning the race, earning the rewards, and having something to place at the feet of Jesus when I appear before him. You, did you know your body does not like to exercise? I don't know if you knew that. Your body does not like to exercise. But here's what Paul is saying. If you cave into what your, your carnal, physical, fleshly appetites crave and desire, if you cave into that, if you allow your physical body to do what it wants to do, what Paul is saying is you will be disqualified. In fact, in 
one of the, something that just, God only knows, God only knows. How, how, many, how many of God's children have lost their ability to compete because their body had its way and, and now by their body they've had to step out of the race. Paul says, that's not happening to me. When my, whenever my body wants me to do something that goes against this book, Paul says, I'm telling my body, no, you don't. No, you're not. You're not going to disqualify me. You're not going to be the cause of me standing before Jesus Christ empty-handed. No, you're not. Paul says, you don't want to run? The flesh says, his body says, I don't want to run. Paul says, you're going to run. You don't want to exercise? Paul, see, Paul and his, see, you commun, your soul communicates with the Holy Spirit and with your flesh. You have two natures. Your body says, you, you, no, I don't want to exercise. And Paul says, you're going to exercise. You're not going to jeopardize my health and put me out of the race and disqualify me from serving God because you don't want to exercise. You're going to get sickly. You're going to get weak. You're going to disqualify. No, you're not. You're going to exercise, Paul says to his body. Um, on and on it goes. Paul says, uh, the body says, let's go ahead and get drunk get drunk. Let's get intoxicated. By the way, uh, alcohol is classified by the, uh, the American Health Association. It's classified as a drug, alcohol. It's one of the drugs. Yeah. Hey! I mean, Paul lived in a very decadent, very sinful, very wicked world of, of Rome. Hey! You don't want that. You want that alcohol? Come on! No! No, you're not going to take me into drunkenness. Mishandling of food. Mishandling of food. No, you're not going to disqualify me by mishandling of food, nourishment. Paul says to his flesh, to his fallen sin nature, no, you want to live to eat? Paul says, no, we're not going to live to eat. Paul says, we're going to eat to live to serve God. And there's a difference. Amen. Amen. Wow. Bodily exercise profiteth little. What's that you say? What's that you say? You, you see that woman? You want to lust after that woman? His body talking to him, his sin nature? You want me to go into adultery, fornication with that? No, we're not going to go into sin against God with that woman. How can I commit this wickedness before the eyes of God and disqualify myself? No! See, Paul made a slave out of his body. Paul's body never made a slave out of him. Now, I'm asking you, whose slave are you? You know, I mean, it's just so incredible. Uh, <clears throat> he goes on in verse 8 of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 8, and he says, uh, he says, uh, but godliness is profitable unto all things, ha having the promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. Godliness benefits for all of your earthly life and all of your, all of your eternal life. Uh, it, it, godliness, godliness. Uh, 
Uh, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Oh, you want me to use that tobacco? Oh, you, you, want, you want me to start you want me to start using tobacco, do you? His flesh says. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. They had all these drugs, they had all this alcohol, they had all this tobacco, and, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. So his body said, yeah, I want you to start doing that. And Paul says, no, we're not going to do that. You're not my master. I'm your master. I'm not your slave. You're my slave. And I'm going to use you to serve Jesus Christ. Wow. Oh, there's a real battle going on, isn't there? The flesh is always after you to knock you out of God's service. And the Holy Spirit is there saying, let's serve God. Saint, child of God, let's serve Jesus. Oh, it's a real battle, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Mm. Now, uh, Galatians 5, please. Uh, I'm mindful of, I'm always mindful of uh, how time flies. Time goes faster at this church than any place else in the city. I promise you that. Take my word for that. Uh, now, um, so, so uh, can we know, matter of factly, what the sinful flesh, what the body, what it wants to do? Yeah, yeah. Galatians five nineteen. Here's what the body wants to do. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, and what's at the top of the list? Isn't that something at the very top of the list? Now, why don't you go on out and have an affair with that woman? Or, or why don't you go out and have an affair with that man, with that, that man or that woman? See, th this is the flesh talking. This is what the body wants to do. This is what Paul's physical body was constantly wanting him to do. Fornication. <sighs> Adultery. Uh, Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Uh, this is all immorality. Uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, uh, and such like of which I tell you before as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's what the body wanted Paul to do. Well, what did the Holy Spirit inside of Paul want Paul to do? What did God want Paul to do? We'll just read on, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Paul, I want you to love that person. That's an unlovely person, but I want you to love that person anyway. Uh, and uh, uh, joy. Be joyful. Peace. Paul's body says, let's worry about this. Let's be anxious about this. And the Holy Spirit says, Paul, I want you to have peace. The peace of God which path, passeth all understanding. A uh, long suffering. Now, uh, you know, Paul's, Paul's body says, I'm going to lose it on this guy. And the Holy Spirit says, oh no, Paul, be long suffering. Be slow to anger, Paul. See? Show him Jesus. Don't show him the ugliness of your flesh. Show him Jesus. Gentleness. Be kind, Paul, be kind. Show them Jesus. Goodness. 
Stay out of immorality. This is moral purity, goodness, faith. Well, I think I'm going to fret. I think I'm going to worry about this. I'm so upset about this. I don't know what I'm going to do about this. I think I'm going to, I'm going to just stay awake all night and be worried sick about this. And God says, Paul, no, let's have faith. Trust the Lord. Meekness. Meekness. Temperance. Under the Holy Spirit's control, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And if we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. You know, people that want to show themselves off instead of showing Jesus off, that's called vain glory. Uh, and, uh, and so they provoke other people and they envy other people uh, because they're not interested in Jesus being seen. They want to be seen. And, and, and the Holy Spirit says, Paul, let, let's, let's, not be, let's not be after vain glory. Let's let Jesus be, uh, have front and center and be, have the spotlight and be the focal point. Paul, it's not about you. It's about him. No vain glory, Paul. Wow. Wow. Um, now, um, let's go back quickly, and we're going to have to wrap this up, but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And so uh, Paul says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a what? The word is castaway, and the word means disqualified. It's like that runner on the track at the Summer Olympics over a decade ago. He, he prepared his whole life for one race, and he's a castaway now because he broke the rules. I mean, I mean... Now, so disqualified. What are the qualifications? What are the qualifications? I want to show you the qualifications. So stay with me just a few minutes longer. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. So I don't want to, I don't want to break the rules. I don't want to be disqualified. So what, what are the rules? What, what are God's rules? You know, we're talking about Paul, all right? We're talking about Paul. And Paul was called by God to be a missionary, to be an evangelist, to be a teacher, to be a pastor. I mean, God used Paul mightily. And so we're talking about the Apostle Paul and the rules that he must abide by in order to avoid disqualification. Now, what are the rules for Paul? I want to show you the rules that Paul is referring to that he did not want to be disqualified by breaking. Are you there? 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a what? Bishop. It's a pastor. That's a, uh, that's, an, that's a, the elder of the church. That's the overseer. He desireth a good work. Now, here are the rules, please. Verse 2, a bishop then must. And what does that word must mean? There's no, there's no debate. There's no arguing. There's no ifs, ands, maybes, or buts about this. A bishop then must be what? Blameless. The... Husband of what? Paul says, I don't want to divorce my wife. 
Now, Paul, now, you know, back to the body, the fallen sin nature. Now, 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 Paul, you know she's better looking than the one you got. Now, just get rid of the one you got and go for her. Paul says, no, we're not doing that. God gave me her. And by the way, Paul was a widower. Paul was at one time married, but then became a widower. And that's how he finished out his race as a widower. Paul says, no, we're not doing that. I don't want to be disqualified. If I divorce my wife, I'm disqualified from the pastorate, from the ministry. Vigilant. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And in context, that verse has to do with Satan's attacks upon the bishop. But he just doesn't attack the bishop, he attacks all of God's children. Sober! Let's go drink! Let's go do some drugs, Paul. Come on, now you know you like the way it makes it. Paul said, no, God says, sober. I'm not going to come under the influence of any chemical. I'm going to stay sober. I'm going to be drunk with the Spirit. I'm going to be under the control and the power of God the Holy Spirit. I will not be disqualified of good behavior. Hey, why don't you go on the internet and why don't you look at some pornography? Now, nobody's looking. Oh, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. God's always looking. I remember a the news, and I think this was back in the 1980s, some journalist had been following a pastor and uh, with a video camera, and it showed this pastor going into a motel room with a woman. The only problem was the woman was not his wife. And then it showed the pastor a while later and the woman emerged out of the motel room and the story went viral. He was caught. Be sure your sins will find you out. He was caught. And then, you know, uh, at the time I was pastoring a minister of the gospel and, uh, and as I would go through the community, uh, people that knew me, uh, they... They were mocking God. They were mocking God's church. They were mocking God's word. They were making fun of because of what one man did, thinking nobody was looking, nobody would see it, nobody would do it. But he thought wrong. When it was all said and done, the whole world knew it. He lost everything. He was disqualified. He lost everything. But if he was saved, he didn't lose that. Oh, yes, saved people can do that. Yes, saved saved people can do that. Yeah, they can do it. But he lost everything that pertained to the work, the ministry. The church, he lost everything. Given to hospitality. Loving others. Helping others. Hospitality. Apt to teach. Not given to wine. No striker. Now the flesh says to Paul, now you, you've had about all the guff you're going to take out of that guy. Now go over there and smack him. What does the word striker mean? 
What's that mean? You, you don't you don't you don't strike somebody. You you don't punch somebody. As a pastor, as a minister of Jesus Christ, oh no, 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 you're no striker. And Paul says, No, I'm not gonna go over and punch that guy in the face. No. No, we're gonna handle this God's way. We're gonna we're gonna do it God's way. Not greedy, a filthy lucre. Now, you know, see that money? See that money there? Go ahead and take that money. Take it. No, Paul said no. No, I'm not going to sell out for money. Patient. Patient. Now, you know, Paul, Paul, you've had about all you can take. Why don't you just, why don't you just quit? Why don't you walk away from it? Why don't you just live the rest of your life doing your own thing? Paul says, no, we're going to endure unto the end. We're going to be patient. Not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Uh, years ago, uh, a man uh, that worked for the Federal Reserve, he was a federal bank examiner. He was attending church. And one day he just bore his heart and shared his story. He said, I started a church in another city. He said, um, and he said, every time I would pastor uh, 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 men and women that were having marriage trouble and wanting to divorce. He said, every time I would counsel them to follow the word of God and, and not divorce, and, and, but to forgive and, and, to, uh, and to trust Jesus and stay together for the glory of God. He said, every time I would counsel people to do that, he said, the Holy Spirit of God would smite me. He said, I had to resign. And he explained to me the reason I had to resign is because what I was preaching to them to do, I had not done with my own wife. He said, I divorced my wife. I married another woman. And now I was telling God's people not to do what I had done. And he said, God would not leave me alone about it. You know what he was saying? I disqualified myself. The husband of one wife. Some will not step away from the ministry if their household is out of control. They won't honor God and step away until the household is in control of God. They'll just sweep it under the rug. Just pretend. And so, uh, verse 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Kids have gone wild, out of control, into all kinds of sin. And if that happens, he won't even step away from the pastorate. He won't even honor the word of God. He'll play, let's pretend. And God's not having it. He's disqualified. Not a novice. Nobody knows more how it should be done than a novice. God says, not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Oh, and what about the deacons? What about the deacons? The same rules for the deacons. One wife. 
No alcohol. No booze. You can read the list. It's all there. Time fails me. The reality is, uh, let me uh, let, let's let's do this. Let me get let me get you over to First Timothy, uh, chapter five. Turn a page, maybe two. First Timothy chapter five. Uh, <clears throat> First Timothy chapter five. You know, sometimes a man has to step out of the ministry to address issues in the home and the family that can be corrected. But some of these issues cannot be corrected. You divorce your wife, you're disqualified. You can bring your family, your house back into under God's control, but look at this. First Timothy chapter number uh, five, I believe it is chapter five, verse 17 through 19. Let the elders, another word for bishop, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Uh, for, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So the responsibility of the church to minister to the needs of the pastor, the bishop, the elder. But then look at verse number 19, and I want you to give special attention to verse 19. Against an elder, receive not what? You're never to receive an accusation against a pastor, but before Unless there are how many witnesses? You know, the devil's always going to have somebody bad mouthing the pastor. This is all part of a spiritual warfare. But God says if somebody comes bad mouthing the pastor, where are the witnesses? Where are the witnesses? No witnesses? Keep your mouth shut. Wow. Because this battle is real. The enemy hates a soul winning church, a praying church, a committed church, a giving church, and is going to do anything he can to tear it up. And Gateway Baptist Church knows that. How well she knows it. Oh, yes. The reality is there's a lot of men running around the country looking for some church to run who messed up at another church. They disqualified themselves. They divorced their wives. They committed adultery. They stole money. And God knows what else they did. And now they want to run another church so they can do it all again. God says no. That's not the way it works. The biggest reason cited by people for why they will not attend a church, the number one reason for, for why people say, I'll never darken the doorway of a church, is because of all the hypocrites in the church. God help. Father, all of this from the Apostle Paul, all of it inspired by God, it's all very intense, it's all very serious, it's very sobering. But Paul said, I have run my race, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. So Paul won the battle against his sinful flesh. He wasn't sneaking around 
to go commit adultery and fornication? Oh, no. He wasn't a drunk? Oh, no. Oh, no. No. No, Paul told his flesh no, and he told God yes. I wonder how many of us here this Lord's Day need to start saying to our flesh no. And need to start saying to God yes. God search us and know us and see if there be any wicked way in us. God help us. We pray in Jesus' name.